Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I know it has been delayed by a year, and the idea of it to start with was to kind of justify why an engineer is actually in the RSB committee, um, probably one of the firsts. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about myself. I don't really get a lot of chances of, of talking about myself. Um, and the work that we have been doing, and as, as Jill um, said earlier, uh, how we engineers are not the enemy, we are a perfect complement to biologists. Um, so just to give you an outline, I will talk about myself a little bit, uh, what my background is, uh, and then uh, because I am a chemical engineer, I would like to introduce the concept of chemical engineering to the room, um, because it's something that some people don't actually know what it is. Um, and then I will give you a few examples of the research that I have been doing over the past few years and hopefully a nice take home message about the friendliness of chemical engineers in research. So I, as you can tell by my name and my accent, I'm not um, originally from the UK. I was born and bred uh, in Salamanca, which is a small town uh, to the west of Madrid. Um, that has one of the oldest universities uh, in Europe, actually. Um, and I studied chemical engineering, spe specializing in biochemical engineering there. Um, and then I also studied a, a master's in, in analytical chemistry because I was always interested in, um, in measuring things. Um, and then at that point, and I imagine that the situation is pretty much the same, um, the, a career in research wasn't really an option in Spain because of the funding restrictions. Um, so I decided to leave everything, my family and my hometown, and come to the UK, barely speaking English at the time, uh, with just one little suitcase, and I moved to Bath, which is a fantastic town um, uh, where I spent almost five years of my life. So I studied my PhD in biochemical engineering as well, and proceeded to carry on on research, do a postdoc over there, working on tissue engineering, which has uh, kind of shaped the rest of my career um, so far. And after that, because I always wanted to be an academic, I went on to um, focus on teaching. Uh, and I spent a couple of years at UCL um, gen creating a new um, stream in biochemical engineering over there. Um, focusing on regenerative medicine and uh, biomaterials and tissue engineering. And then in 2018, I had the fantastic opportunity to become a lecturer at Aston. Um, that has brought me a lot of joy in my career, but especially in my personal life with the amazing friends that I've made uh, in the past few years. And then only a couple of months ago, I moved to the University of Birmingham to carry on my uh, career as, a, as an academic. Uh, and I can't tell you very much about that because I am just finding my feet at the moment. And something else that I would like to mention, and I always have to have a picture of her. Uh, I also have a, I had a little bit of a career break one week before the national lockdown started, when my lovely daughter Elizabeth, Isabel was born. Um, so that was a little bit of a um, stop in, in the science front, let's say, but never stopping in the learning curve. So I'm just going to ask the room if you have, before you have a chance of reading that, if anybody knows what a chemical engineer does. They make chemicals. They make chemicals. So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of chemical engineering? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, chemical Lego. Yes. So I went to, um, to the internet and I found a very nice definition in the um, uh, New Scientist's uh, job website where they talk about how chemical engineers convert raw materials into things that we use every day. And I think that is quite a good definition. I also went into the IKME, uh, which is the equivalent of the RSB for chemical engineers. And I saw a couple of interesting things um, where they say that chemical engineers design modify and operate processes to produce the things that we rely on every day. So chemical engineering is all around us uh, in the clothes you wear, in the food you eat, in the cosmetics that you use. And 
before because of this and because of the transferable skills that chemical engineers learn during their undergraduate or masters um, they are very employable and they are one of the highest earners in the US actually so this is what I think the world thinks of chemical engineers or when you hear chemical engineering which is a massive oil refinery a chemical plant or a massive tank where beer is brewed. <laughs> However, put a chemical engineer in a biology lab, and this is what some biologists think of chemical engineers. <laughs> Plumbers, they love their tubes, their pipes, and their bowls, and their valves. Or cooks, they love their pots and pans. That's what a lot of the biologists that I've met in my life have thought about a chemical engineer when he's put in a biology lab. But this is what I would like you to take home today, and this is what my view of a chemical engineer is, which is a problem solver. So a chemical engineer sees a problem in the real world and tries to come up with a solution. But in order to do that, a chemical engineer needs a bit of knowledge of chemistry, physics, maths, material science, logistics, economics and marketing, design, and of course, biology. So as you can imagine, a single chemical engineer can't do this uh, by themselves. And that's why we seek help of the experts in other areas like biology. So I wanted to take this opportunity as well to mention the two chemical engineers that have shaped my career. Uh, Professor Eva Martin del Valle, who is uh, a professor at the University of Salamanca, my alma mater, and Professor Marianne Ellis, who is a professor at the University of Bath. And I could spend 20 minutes talking about the history of chemical engineering and the fathers of chemical engineering, but I just want to focus on these two uh, fantastic scientists that are also chemical engineers. And the reason is they had uh, a vision of how they could apply their engineering skills and principles and seeked help from biologists and clinicians to, to shape their careers, really. Um, so both of them are incredibly successful. They are chemical engineers by training, but if you ask them um, if they have ever worked in an oil refinery, they will probably say no. Um, so uh, Professor Martin Del Valle, uh, dedicates her life to finding um, new cures for breast cancer in a sort of scalable manner and in a clever way. And Professor Marianne Ellis, on top of being an academic, is an entrepreneur. She's got two companies uh, and she, her current research focuses on cultivated meat or artificial meat. Um, so yeah, I would like to dedicate this talk to them. But anyway, um, after that, I would like to give you some examples of what I have actually done in my career as a chemical engineer slash scientist. And I'm going to give you four examples. Uh, I'm going to talk about my PhD work uh, in which I tried to tackle antibiotic resistance in um, skin infections. Um, a little bit of tissue engineering work that I did during my postdoc uh, related to the sa safety in cosmetic testing without the use of animals. Um, and some of the current research that we are conducting in my research group related to providing uh, better models of spinal cord injuries um, to uh, discover new therapeutics. And also engineering a scalable um, treatment for large burns. So as I said, um, chemical engineers like finding a problem and then uh, trying to um, find a solution. So in every single of these topics, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, everybody has heard of antibiotic resistance before. Um, something that I hadn't heard about when I started my PhD uh, coming from a country like Spain is that uh, many, many children every year in the UK suffer from burns because of uh, scalds from hot water and that really doesn't happen in my country because we don't have kettles to start with um, but a lot of these children um, that suffer from a, from a burn um, they start becoming very ill uh, because those burns get infected 
and because they're little, um, they can't really tell you what is wrong and um, therefore they can become incredibly ill. So the motivation for the project uh, was kind of dedicated to these small children uh, with uh, burns on a large body surface area of the, um, sorry, the surface area of their body. And the group uh, where I worked at Bath um, had a lot of success in creating dressings, wound dressings that will glow up when the when a bacterial infection was present. So you don't have to ask the child what is wrong with you. Actually, the wound dressing will tell you um, that uh, there was a, a bacterial infection. But related to this and trying to um, incorporate a new uh, sort of therapeutic for um, bacterial infections without the use of antibiotics, um, we it tried to incorporate bacteriophage, uh, which is a virus that kills bacteria without um, killing mammalian cells. And it has, uh, the use of bacteriophage has been proven to work for skin infections with Staph aureus uh, in animals before. And uh, bacteriophage has um, some advantages um, compared with antibiotics. Some of the microbiologists might not agree with me uh, in this respect. Uh, but you can use a cocktail of bacteriophage to overcome resistance, for example. And in general, the side effects are, um, are not particularly um, awful. But uh, how can bacteriophage be delivered to a patient with a, with a burn or with a wound uh, in, a, in a friendly manner? So with the chemical engineering knowledge, for example, uh, of making mayonnaise uh, or face creams, uh, which is an emulsion. Uh, we came up with a solution. I don't think you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse in my screen. I don't think so. Um, but the idea was to kind of suspend the bacteriophage particles in an emulsion formulation. So they would be able to be kept happy uh, and, and have a, a long shelf life. So you can sell it as a pharmaceutical product, let's say, or um, uh, in, in your local boots. And that's how it would work. Uh, so the bacteriophage will be happily living in the, um, in the um, environment uh, made of those emulsion droplets. Um, and then they will come to the uh, bacterial cell if there was an infection attached to the surface, inject the DNA, and then start um, replicating and making the, the components inside the bacterial cell, um, ending up in bursting that cell um, completely open and, and killing the, um, the bacteria. And something that, as you know, in science happens very often, uh, just pretty much by accident, we found um, that this bacteriophage formulation in the oil and water emulsion, so pretty much in mayonnaise, um, was even more effective than using bacteriophage on their own. So that was incredibly interesting, and that's what that graph is showing over there, um, where uh, when when you add bacteriophage on their own, and that's kind of I can't I can't really point at it. Um, that's kind of the the white dots on the screen. Um, bacteriophage start killing bacteria, but maybe they left one or two bacterial cells over there that weren't discovered, and then bacteria starts growing all the way up again. Whereas when you use the bacteriophage emulsion formulation, um, it kills the bacterial infection completely. And this was done in planktonic culture, so in suspension. Um, but as you can see in a couple of slides, we went on and uh, did some work on biofilms. But you can imagine as a chemical engineer doing all of these microbiology experiments was a little bit frustrating. Um, I understand, I kind of understand the biology, but I don't particularly enjoy the manual labor that comes with microbiology. Um, so I decided that I wanted to incorporate a little bit of engineering into the project. And uh, something that chemicals, chemical engineers absolutely love is material balances. Whatever comes in has to come out. And that's pretty much what these uh, monstrous equations are showing. So you need to have your bacteriophage and your bacterial cells in one way or another going into the system and coming out. And um, as I said, using these little equations, uh, and some mathematical um, software, um, I managed to reproduce, if you have a look at the uh, blue line in the slide, 
compared to the red dots on the slide, you can see that they're pretty similar. So using a mathematical model, it was what it was possible to actually reproduce or mimic what was happening in the lab in the experiments. And the idea of this was that I would save a little bit of time and sanity uh, while I was doing my experiments uh, and um, actually predict what would happen in situations that perhaps you can't actually reproduce in the lab. So, as I said, that emulsion formulation worked really well in suspension uh, in bacteria in planktonic culture. But we used, again, a little bit of engineering to um, generate uh, a model of a biofilm, which is what you actually find in a wound. So you don't find bacteria floating around, but you find them in association with other bacterial cells in a biofilm. And uh, you can see the lovely green biofilm growing over there with, of Staph aureus. When you apply the emulsion and bacteriophage formulation, you can see that it's completely uh, eradicated. So that worked um, very well as well. So the next kind of um, line of research that um, I, did, I developed during my postdoc uh, was on cosmetic testing. And this was in collaboration with Unilever. Uh, which makes a lot of the shampoos and uh, hair products and toothpastes and things like that that you use. Um, and their idea was that, um, as you know, um, cosmetic testing in animals is currently banned in the EU, uh, but the models that they have to test their components or the ingredients or the products in the lab is not particularly good. So the um, uh, this is from a toxicology and safety point of view. So um, in order to see if um, a cosmetic ingredient is safe for human use, um, the companies the, uh, or, or the labs, they obtain um, a, a, a piece of skin from plastic surgery from humans or from pigs. And then they apply whatever ingredient on top and see how much goes through the layers of skin and, and is collected underneath the skin. Um, but the issue with this is that neither the skin from plastic surgery or the skin from pigs has any vasculature and therefore it doesn't actually mimic what happens in the human body when, um, when some chemical is applied on the skin. So as you can imagine, the, um, the structure of the skin is very complicated from a cellular and extracellular point of view. But it's also even more complicated if we consider all the little capillaries that are um, surrounding the whole tissue. Um, so what we thought from a chemical engineering perspective, because as I said, we love our pipes and our tubes, uh, is that blood vessels are actually tubes. So if we can incorporate these tubes uh, into the skin somehow, we can create that sink effect that having a blood circulation going under your skin or within your skin has in vivo. So we had a look in the literature for uh, information on those little loops that you can see at the top of the uh, at the top of the slide over there in the epidermal dermal junction. How many of these do we have? How long are they? And what surface area do they cover? And then we tried to match this with artificial tubes made in the lab. And you can see the tubes on the left-hand side uh, at the bottom. Those are the devices that are commercially available and that companies actually use for their cosmetics testing. So we uh, modified them incorporating those little four tubes that you can see over there in white. And the idea is that the skin will go on top of that and then we would apply our chemical and see how much of it would be carried through those tubes as if it was the, the blood circulation. And what we saw that was incredibly interesting is that, um, which is in the black bars, is that there was a lot more of the ingredient that came through those tubes rather than when you don't when you don't have the tubes underneath the skin, which means that you are creating that sink effect that your blood circulation does just because the, the, the you have fluid moving and the and the um, the epidermis. So that is more representative of the um, uh, the situation in vivo. However, as you can see, those tubes are really big, but we also managed to make tiny, teeny, tiny tubes. Oh, you can't see the the pictures over at the top, at the bottom, it doesn't matter. 
Um, so you can, uh, we managed to make those little tubes very, very small. They look like a, pretty much like a hair. And I was trained by a plastic surgeon um, to do surgical threading, I guess, um, uh, which unfortunately you can't see on those pictures at the bottom. But um, we managed to incorporate those artificial tubes in the kind of epidermal dermal junction and got very similar results than those that we um, obtained with the big tubes. And this project actually got me to Parliament, uh, where I had the, the chance to meet Boris Johnson's brother when he was the Ministry of Education, I think he was. Um, uh, and I also um, was nominated um, by the IKME as a young researcher um, in, in, in the area. So that was very exciting. But unfortunately, and um, with projects that involve industry, this is very common. The funding was over and I had to move on. Um, uh, so as I said, I taught for a couple of years. Uh, that was incredibly enlightening from um, the perspective of um, how much I actually learned from the students that I taught. And that gave me a lot of ideas for my research when I started at Aston. So this is the third, sorry, I'm one board you for very much longer. This is the third um, stream of research that I wanted to talk to you about, which is spinal cord injuries, which are um, very awful, they're awful for the people who suffer them, but they are also awful, awful for the NHS or for the healthcare systems because they're very costly. Um, and there is currently no cure. Um, but in, I think it was 2014, these make the news uh, which was a paralyzed man uh, who started walking again after suffering from a spinal cord injury. And what this man was given was his own cells. So these were cells that came from um, the, his nose, which are uh, called olfactory and sheathing cells. And they are the, the cells that help you recover your sense of smell when you have a cold. Um, and obviously that was a singular piece of news. They ha there have been some other um, pieces of news using the same sort of cells um, in dogs, in sausage dogs, for example. Uh, but this is not something that has that is a mainstream, let's say, treatment for everybody. So I started thinking why this is not something that everybody can have or, or that doesn't work all the time. And this is kind of how they work, these olfactory and cheating cells. But what we started thinking is, um, the spinal cord obviously is not um, it's not very hard, is it, in terms of the mechanical properties. It's something really soft part of the central nervous system. Um, so what we started thinking is, these olfactory and sheathing cells, how do they actually behave when they are put, put in a soft environment rather than in the plastic where we grow them in the lab? So we started growing them. And the, these ones at the, bo the bottom of the screen, you can see at the bottom left, you can see um, those, these olfactory and seeding cells that actually come from a patient um, growing on plastic on the normal polystyrene plates that we use in the lab. And on the top right, you can see them growing uh, in exactly the same conditions, but they are growing in uh, a soft substrate. And as you can see, they don't look the same at all. Their distribution doesn't look the same at all. And then if you have a look at the confluency, so how much of the surface of a plate they cover, you can see that they go to almost 80% confluency after uh, four days. So they cover all your plate um, when they're grown on plastic, but they don't pretty much don't cover anything when they are grown on, um, on a soft substrate. And that is because they, as you can see in the picture that they're kind of started growing on top of each other. And exactly the same happens with the number of doublings, so how much these cells are growing. So if you have a look at plastic, they pretty much double uh, or double seven times in in a period of time, whereas they don't double at all uh, in uh, in those 16 days when they are grown in um, in a soft substrate. So these gave us an idea that actually the environment in which, or the, actually the mechanical properties of the environment where they are grown, um, has an effect on cell growth, proliferation, and and actually the manner in which where they grow. So then we started looking at the spinal cord injury, and this was a paper that came out in 2017. 
uh, where the scientists looked at the mechanical properties of the spinal cord in rats and uh, they found something that is really interesting, which is when the spinal cord gets injured and there's a scar forming, um, the actual mechanical properties, uh, you would expect that that um, injured spinal cord, because there's a scar forming, becomes harder because there's a fibrotic tissue. However, these scientists saw that it's just the opposite, that it becomes softer, which is very strange. So just as a, as a reference, um, because you can see pascals as the units over there. Um, the uh, tissue culture plastic that we use in the lab is around 10,000 kilopascals, whereas the healthy and um, injured spinal cord are not 0.2 kilopascals. So that is a really, really big difference. Um, so then we started thinking, how can we model this in the lab because you can obviously buy these soft materials that have certain mechanical properties but you cannot buy something that when you shake or when you um, subject to pressure becomes softer so what can we find that actually mimics that um, we came up with something that also has been very much used in the food industry which is called fluid gels and these are like everybody has probably heard of hydrogels um, that are kind of shaken to make little pockets, as you can see in the second um, picture at the bottom, little pockets of hydrogels that are kind of um, softly bound to each other. And when you shake them, they disperse and the material becomes softer, which is exactly what happens in the, um, in the spinal cord when it's injured. So we went on to measuring the mechanical properties of these um, fluid gels, which are made of uh, gel and gum, which is a vegan supplement. So it's something that you can actually find on Amazon or in, um, in shops around. And we varying the concentration. We kind of found the, that sweet spot um, shown there in, um, in the kind of square, orange square thing for healthy and the injured spinal cord. And that is what it looks like when you freeze it um, and then image it uh, in an electron microscope. And you can see um, at the bottom of the screen, those kind of sheets that are those pockets of hydrogels once they have been um, dried. So another thing about the spinal cord, if these things weren't complicated enough, is that the motor neurons, which are one of the most important um, cell types, are nicely aligned, as you can see, at the top of the screen there um, and that alignment is actually broken when uh, when an injury occurs so can, how can we reproduce this uh, in vitro so i would like to uh, take you back to my teeny tiny tubes that i used as uh, surrogates for blood vessels well they can also be made to align cells um, in, vi in vitro so this is how um, you can see that is a that is a very sophisticated um, setup with a syringe pump over a beaker of water, and that's how we make our teeny tiny tubes that under an electron microscope look like this. So they are they've got estriations all along um, their axis, and that allows for cells to align all the way along, like you would see in spinal cord. And I won't bore you with what those graphs mean, but I what I would like you to see is how these um, uh, green fluorescent cells, courtesy of my good colleague, Dr. Hill over here, um, align very, very nicely along the axis of the, of the micro hollow fiber, these little tubes, uh, and we were able to quantify this. So we've got two little elements now um, to kind of model the spinal cord in, in vitro. And where are we going now with this? Um, we want to put this in a teeny tiny chip, um, combining both things uh, and uh, being able to um, test different compounds that may uh, or may not influence our behavior once they are put in this little microenvironment. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, kind of carrying on with the skin theme. Um, what happens with someone gets a burn? Uh, that is less than 40% of their body surface area. Normally you can get a skin graft and then you go uh, back to your normal life. 
happy as Larry, hopefully. But when more than 40% of the body surface area is affected, uh, it is very difficult to treat, mainly because um, there's not very much skin donors. Um, and there's also, you can't really get skin from your own body because more than 40% of it is already burned, right? So what can we do in that particular case? So I would like to thank uh, the charity Restore, who funded the very first stages of this project that has now become um, a PhD project, which is to actually <coughs> get keratinocytes, which are the cells that are, or can resurface your, your, your skin wound, and grow them in large quantities. But this is not straightforward for many reasons. First of all, keratinocytes don't really like being grown in the lab whatsoever. And second of all, keratinocytes have uh, some sort of um, stemness in them that is lost when they are grown on very hard surfaces. So you can see kind of the theme over here. Um, so how can these be done in really large quantities, perhaps not even using those massive plastic um, surfaces or perhaps not even using one of those big bioreactors? So again, we started thinking about the microenvironment where the keratinocytes are. And we started thinking they do need some sort of uh, extracellular matrix component, uh, i.e. collagen, to attach to surfaces. And who provides that? Well, fibroblasts secrete it. So why don't we get some sort of um, artificial extracellular matrix where our fibroblasts can be grown? And then the fibroblasts will, will start pumping out collagen and then the keratinocytes can bind to that collagen that is, um, that is being secreted. And then we can put these little spheres with our keratinocytes growing on the, on the surface in a big bioreactor and then get lots and lots of keratinocytes. Even better, if this extracellular matrix is biocompatible, so these little spheres are biocompatible, we don't actually need to detach the keratinocytes off them. We can literally spray them straight away into a wound to start resurfacing. So again, you can see very sophisticated um, um, setups over there, uh, where we um, very dangerously started playing with uh, um, a power supply to generate an electrospraying device uh, that would allow us to generate this little um, sphere for growing keratinocytes. Then we moved on to safer methods, let's say, using centrifugation, and we ended up getting these little spheres made of um, uh, biocompatible polymers. What is more most interesting about this project uh, is that the actual material that those spheres have made are made of is fibrous, like you can see on the left hand side in that screen, of that screen, um, which the, uh, which allows cells to spread uh, within, but because it is fibrous, it mimics the extracellular matrix. And as you can see, you can make them into spheres for the keratinocytes to then grow on top. And something that is even better as well is that they are sprayable. You can spray them like you would do if uh, you were trying to resurface a wound. So, so far, we have shown that we can grow fibroblasts, uh, shown in red in there, um, within this artificial matrix. And the idea will be, as you can see in the kind of diagram over there, that they will start secreting their own collagen. So, I hope. I didn't bore you too much. I just wanted to kind of summarize everything that I've said um, as from a chemical engineer intruding into biology. Um, it's sometimes really difficult to find what your mission and your vision is. And for me, it is the creation of translational technologies, things, devices, as you can see, those um, very much uh, homemade looking setups that you can um, then use for um, uh, finding solutions to biological problems in, the, in my particular case or related to healthcare. So obviously they can be applied for tissue engineering um, to create in vitro models of different uh, organs and tissues. There's a lot of um, interest in organoid modeling, um, again, to develop new therapeutics. Um, drug delivery systems, a lot of these technologies that I have shown can be also used for drug delivery and also um, in terms of scaling up and making up uh, these um, uh, really big amounts of cells that are necessary for a treatment in, in bioprocessing. 
So hopefully after this talk um, you would know and would always know that uh, chemical engineers do not only uh, just operate chemical plants, that we do not like to stay in our own lanes, we really like going on to the other lane all the time, um, that as you can see hopefully from the examples that I've given, uh, biology is the, at the core of our chemical engineering or chemical engineering research. And something that I have obviously learned from my mentors over the years is that collaboration and multidisciplinary research is what drives innovation. And for that, I would like to thank uh, everybody who has been part of um, my career and my academic life, particularly these three individuals. Some of them don't look like that anymore <laughs> <laughs> after a few years of research. So David Jenkins, who's going to be doctor very soon, who's worked on spinal cord work. Ed, uh, an absolute genius who's working on the um, extra, artificial extracellular matrix. Katie, who is working as well on the spinal cord project. Of course, the amazing technician that is over here in the, in the, um, in, in the room, Dr. Rachel Caves. Um, the person who kept my sanity during the first years at Aston, Dr. Rachel Wood, who is in New Zealand at the moment. And then, uh, obviously, Dr. Eric Hill, who's here and who's helped me so much. Um, my, let's say, more senior mentors, uh, Professor Liam Grover, Professor Anthony Edcalf, Professor Jackie Hunter, who's actually my, um, my personal mentor, Professor Ivan Wall, and everybody at Aston, and all of you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions.